and uh, like we're live. I see my summaries. Huh? Excellent. You, you wanted the link though? Yes. All right. Send I'll it put to it me. in the chat for you. Welcome everyone to the six round post fight show for UFC Singapore coming several hours late. I just woke up at uh, seven this morning, right as the card ended, and watched it all afterward on delay, just fast forwarding through it with a cup of coffee. And I got to say, a perfect way to watch this card. This card, I, I had hoped this would be the result because there were a lot of fights coming in that I was like, I'm actually really interested to see how Naoki in a way and, you know, uh, Ji Young Kim and Jake Matthews and Yan Zhao Nan and, uh, Song Yadong and Peter Yan. I'm, I'm interested to see how all these fighters perform. So I was kind of invested going in, and it was a lot of fun to watch most of this card, and especially to watch it like fast, knowing that I have the rest of the day afterward to do other things. Yeah, it's good to be able to watch a card and have like sunlight outside. Mm -hmm. It's 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 especially inspiring. Yeah, especially for you guys in the UK who got this card at like a normal workable hour. Yeah, yeah, like he hearing from like the US guys, like, oh, oh my god, we're gonna have to watch this card. Uh, you know, this card starts at two o'clock in the morning. It's a crazy time to watch MMA. Yeah, 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 it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh anyway, um, eventually, I mean, first thing to talk about is. Solid coming out party for Leon Edwards as an actual top-ranked welterweight. And a solid sign that Don Cerrone is not anymore to yep. me. Like, there was a lot of talk oh, during the fight where they're like, oh, I don't know, Edwards might need to press harder. Has he done enough to win? Like, he has really clearly done enough to win at least three rounds of this fight. Yeah, I had him winning a minimum of four. Yeah. But, uh... Yeah, uh, Donald Cerrone, you know, he's he's clearly getting older and more fragile and slower and even slower starting. And and he's in in some ways, I feel like his welterweight career has been an amazing assertion of an ability to hide the fact that he's really not cut out for this weight class. Mm -hmm. Like he's done he's every time he's unveiled a new trick to kind of keep people from realizing that he really needs functional kicking range where he can't be punched back in return. He needs that extra range. He needs to be insulated by his frame. And so he's picked up all these things, better counter punching, better clinch game, going back to, you know, learning how to hit counter blast doubles and all this kind of stuff to just basically cover up the fact that he just can't exchange in the pocket with people who have the, who have the same or bigger frame than him. Yeah. And definitely... this was just a real a realization of that together with a a slightly fading chin and uh yeah. just general slight physical deterioration. I, I mean, I'm glad he's not he's not just washed yet. This was also a good sign like Don Cerrone's not done, you know, getting yeah. knocked out by Darren Till losing a couple fights, a lot of people were like, oh, Don Cerrone's just done. He got knocked out by Jorge Masvidal, lost to Robbie Lawler, got knocked out by Darren Till. But you actually go back and watch those fights, and, you know, it was always my thing. It was like, it's not like one punch is dropping him. It's a prolonged beating where he would take four or five or six or seven really hard shots and then be TKO'd, like still get up and be like around, not just flatline you know it's not like what we saw with mike pile at the end of his career where you're just like every time you get hit you are out for five minutes yeah um so i'm it, but it does make me worry a bit that he's going to then be going the way of like josh berkman eventually where you're not going to see just a magical drop off in chin or any clear drop off in athleticism although he's clearly lost a bit of a step or a serious step, it's just going to be less and less active, less and less yeah. able to take over a fight at any point and put together enough strikes to to do anything. Or, you know, Carlos Condit's kind of become the same way, where suddenly now you're watching Carlos Condit in a kickboxing match with Neil Magny, and you're like, you don't really pull the trigger on anything anymore. 
Yeah, I mean, Cerrone has always been a slow starter, but yeah, the worry is that like, okay, you're a slow starter for the first three minutes of the first round. You're a slow starter for the first entire round. You're the first a slow starter for one and a half rounds. And then eventually you're just like, you're now talking about someone who's a punching bag for 12 minutes. Yeah. Like, this is the this is the the worry. And he's never he's he's not a defensive. He's of the many things that Donald Cerrone is, and he is a great a great fighter. He is not a defensive mastermind. No, and he has taken a hellacious amount of punishment over his career. And yeah, yeah this was definitely this definitely made me think. Like, I don't know if I want him to go back down to lightweight because I, I, he's he's a large man, <laughs> but yeah. also he's he's not equipped to be facing these guys at this stage in his career anymore. Not really. And I, no, I don't think that's going to, that isn't something that's going to, that's going to get better over time. Yeah. There's, there's clearly like the Robbie Lawler fight showed that there's clearly much like Robbie Lawler. There's still a place for him on the silver circuit of the UFC. You know, there yeah. are guys like Jim Miller who he's already knocked out. I know, but I mean, that's kind of the problem for Don Cerrone is he has literally already fought every single person in lightweight and now working his way to fighting every single person in welterweight as well. But there, you know, there are guys who aren't, I'm, he'll never fight Condit. They have trained together for too long, but there are guys in that same range, RDA, people like that, where you're like, you know, these would still be good, interesting, competitive fights. Even if. I th yeah. I, I, th I think, you know what, the, he's, they've now, uh, ascertained what he is and he's a wheat from chaff sorter for for dark horse welterweight fighters yep. so i think we get uh zaleski dos santos oh, uh, yeah, Bilal, Bilal Muhammad, these kind of fighters this is this is exactly the guy he's gonna be he's gonna be and that may that would make sense too because he's always been a take every fight put in front of him kind of fighter which means mm -hmm. that easy fighter to book into against young rising talent because you know a lot of guys they get to his position you get to being uriah faber out there and faber's like i just want to fight big super fights that are fun for like the last two years of his career that's all he did and then you get guys like sarney who are just like oh yeah sure whatever just hook yeah. me up with the new fight and i'll take it i mean he is the ultimate company man as far as yep. fight bookings go yep so uh it it was definitely like a changing of the guard fight here, and yeah, because, uh, yeah, I, sorry, uh, yeah, Till, like Till, for example, like knocking, watching Cerrone get finished early by an aggressive, like a pre an aggressive, aggressive fighter, somebody you can walk, a, aggressive play. southpaw yeah. pressure fighter. Like I was just like, yeah, that could have happened yeah. at any any time in his career, but this this was like. This is Donald Cerrone getting consistently outfought for a, a vast, the vast majority of a fight, and yeah. maybe surging slightly towards the end, and that's just not anything we've really seen from him before. This was definitely like this was something I I just didn't think would have happened before. Like yeah. it's it's it's, a, it's partially a frame thing. I think it's you know I don't think he's he's really cut out for welterweight, and he's been great about kind of hiding that, but it's also like, I just don't think this would have happened in the past. Yeah, it's just because, I mean, I remember watching tape on this fight, and I was just like, there's nothing to Edward's game that I see that just says, this beats Donald Cerrone. And too, it, yeah. true to form, he didn't get takedowns, he didn't hold him down, he didn't grind him at all, which is something that's never worked on Donald Cerrone in the past. And he didn't pressure him consistently. He didn't just walk him down and pressure over and over and over again. He backed up a lot, he counterpunched a lot, he just waited a lot on, on strikes. It's just Donald Cerrone couldn't fill that space or hurt him hurt worse. Yeah. And, he didn't and, and it's a lot, it's, which was really smart. Yeah. And, and it's just the fact that if he doesn't have a significant, like height and reach advantage, Donald Cerrone is forced to box with people. Yeah. And this was, he boxed a lot in this fight yeah. and it, it's just never, a, it's just never something he can hold up on for that long, unless he has a huge technical advantage over the other guy. So good win for Edward, something that puts him probably pretty clearly up into the top 10. Now um, trying to remember 
he, he's right. in the top I ten. Know right? They're always trash, but they usually yeah. have a certain amount of logic behind them. Who's ahead of him right now? Uh, riding right up ahead of him is Santiago Ponzinibbio and Jorge Masvidal and Neil Magny. So he's definitely, I mean, he might have to beat one of those guys, but he's definitely right on the cusp of, he's, he's in that same group easily. Yeah. And all like relatively winnable fights for him. I yeah. think I'd probably, I'd, I'd probably slightly favor him in 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 those fights apart from Magny. as apart from the ponds. I think. Yeah, I'd favor him over Magny. Masvidal might be a bit of a pick 'em, depending. Masvidal is always willing to coast, but we what we saw Edward from Edwards here too was a fighter very willing to coast on an advantage. So I don't know that I'd ne- ne- necessarily just will take him to absolutely take over against Masvidal, but Ponzinibbio is probably the guy that I would least likely pick him against. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Um, before that, Ovin St. Pru beat Tyson Pedro, and I know... I... <laughs> Damn it. Like, we were talking about this on the Depressed Us. We were, and there's always <laughs> this... O- OSP just has this stupid magic to him where he 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 just is able to be big and powerful and incredibly incredibly able to finish fights and he's able to do that all fight and light heavyweight is not very good and so sometimes just being big and tough and there and dangerous is more than enough yeah we, we were talking we were talking about it and you, you and we were all, we were all like so tyson pedro is going to be Beating the crap out of out of o- OSP. What weird way do you think OSP is going to win? Like yeah. head kick, clinch knee, weird submission, <laughs> and then you <laughs> did both you and Connor like then then decide that you were going to try and go with the forces of light and pick. I, pick I, at the, least I know why. Heavyweight prospect. I picked yeah. Pedro just because I didn't think he'd get finished. And I thought people picking OSP by decision, like OSP ever wins decisions that aren't just the worst fight imaginable. He he is absolutely only a, a fighter who like loses every minute of a round up until he wins the whole fight. And then, man, there was that moment where Pedro tied, tried to take down and got hip tossed. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I can yeah. feel this. And then he went for a sacrifice throw, and it was just like, what are you doing? You've literally taken a guy who is a half person bigger, way stronger than you, and just that much more athletic than you, and you're trying a sacrifice throw. You can only drag him on top of you. There's literally no other way for that to end. And It's also, it's also the, the, thing, the thing of like, don't do mirror match shit on people. Like, yeah. if you're up against some some guy who's the king of weird shit, don't try and weird shit them. Yeah, <laughs> fuck you up. They're gonna be like, this is exactly what I'd do in this position. I would go for this weird throw, this weird submission. I am this. I'm so reading this. Yeah, and and you could see like OSP was just like, oh yeah, I'm here. This is my fight now. We're going for strange <laughs> stuff. I'm just gonna sit inside control and, and goodbye. Yeah, a straight yeah. arm bar. Just and the mm. moment he extended it, you could see the look on Pedro's face was just like pure panic and just it had to tap immediately afterward. And he was absolutely lighting OSP up. That's a fight that I mean, I wanna say it's a fight three years from now he wins, but it's probably a fight three years from now where he gets von Flued. So <laughs> I mean, in some ways, it's a fight he could win, like, now. Today? Yeah. You could just, just be like, you know when you were just standing at range and just kicking him in the head for free? Have you considered continuing to do that? Yeah, just, like, stand that, at that range? That was why I head? picked him, as I watched OSP against uh, Marcos Rogerio de Lima, where Delima just all only leans on a power kicking game outside, which is ninety uh, percent of what Tyson Pedro likes to do from outside, and Delima just had a, a free round of teeing off on OSP. Before OSP was like, "Oh, I'm just going to push you over and submit you," 
And I was like, well, Pedro won't just get pushed over and submitted. That's mm -hmm. not. <laughs> Welcome to the 205 pound division. <laughs> Yeah, so OSP, he stays right back in that top 10 he light heavyweight mix that's going to push him up towards another title shot or something that he's going to fight Daniel Cormier. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and get absolutely annihilated and then turn Do around they... and beat five young contenders. Do they risk, like, Dominic Reyes against him? They won't, will they? No, that would be dumb. I don't know. They're better. They probably will. That's exactly the kind of fight the UFC loves to throw guys like Tyson Pedro in and Dominic Reyes in. They're like, oh, you look like mm -hmm. you're you, you're pretty good and you've won a couple of good fights. Fight your fight Alir Latifi, fight Ovin St. Pru. Go after it. Yep. Yeah. For that woman's flyweight bout, Jessica I beat Jessica Rose Clark. And this is also one of the things I wanted to say. O OSP and his arm bar notwithstanding, the big thing that struck me about this card is that this was pretty much ultimate kickboxing all the way mm. through. That yeah. was one of the notable things was trying to bank on which fighter was going to use more of their game and be intelligent and like mix things in, do take the fight somewhere else that their opponent would be less skilled. Literally, almost nobody did that at all. And yeah. Shoutouts to like Shane Young. Yeah. And no one else. Shane Young and shout out. Yeah, it's just like watching. You, we'll get to it or later, but Schnell, Schnell versus Inway. Mm. And just like, what are you doing? What? Why? Or Ulka Sasaki is also the, the person to shout out who oh, was yeah. just like, I don't have to box this dude. Are you kidding? <laughs> but everybody else. Jessica Rose Clark, especially, was just like, you know, you know, Jessica, I, let's just only have a slow paced kickboxing bout where the fact that you're a bit better athlete and you throw a little bit straighter shots with a little bit more power where that can just come up in every round. So, yeah, this this was definitely another one of those like mirror match. Yeah. Fights where you would like because. I think you, like me, had the same read on this fight, in that there's no real reason for Jessica Rose Clark to win this fight, apart no. from the fact that she tries hard to win fights, and yeah. Jessica and, doesn't. Yeah. But the thing is that, like, a confidence differential gets erased when you're fighting yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of something that we saw, is that Jessica or I was able to immediately settle into what is essentially the best form of her of of her game, which as unimpressive as sort of unimpressive as that is, meant that she was able to, you know, she was able to throw together actual combinations. She was able to build off her jab. And Jessica I was just kind of a step behind. I yeah. think there's still like several people that would beat Jessica I that Jessica Rose Clark could probably beat. Like she would do better against a wider array of style matchups. But in the mirror match, Jessica I was just like, I've been doing this style for a really long time and you haven't yeah part of me kind of too was just like clark would land these big overhand rights that you could see they're exactly the kind of thing that just saps eyes confidence shuts her down yeah but she then tried to like go back outside mix it up reset her entries and all that and it's just like if you just threw five more of those overhand rights jessica i's not going to adjust to that she'll just eat them and then she'll just panic and do something weird and but there was no or point at which if you, just shot and, if you just shot and tried to smother her yeah like if you just get her into a horrible boring like clinch exchange at that point that's the point at which she starts to panic and think oh my god i'm down i need to yeah but instead she was just like oh yeah i landed that let's go back to kind of fencing at range and would just yeah just slowly and progressively get out pointed yeah it's still it's the kind of performance that unfortunately it it it, it exposes what has always been a worry is that Clark is just not a very good baseline athlete and up at the top as she climbs up towards better athletes she's going to lose fights because of it she can't she's not dynamic enough to change the direction of a fight in any instant I and, mean the thing is oh yeah no you you can no I was uh, 
For I, it's, like, it's the exact same. It, it's like it's a win that also looks like it's like okay, yeah, but you're still gonna turn around and fight even somebody like uh, oh, um, who's the damn it? Uh, you're gonna fight somebody like Alexis Davis and just lose because Alexis Davis will stay on you. Yeah, it's it's one of these monkeys paw type things of of certain fighters is that you're you're like is that a lot of, a lot of the time you'd look at a fighter and you'd be you'd be like what if fighter X was just just had something a bit more to them like what if Melvin Gillard had a chin and you'd be like oh here's Michael Johnson he's and and through more and you're like oh here's Michael Johnson and his underlying floor is still pretty crippling <laughs> and then you're like what if Jessica I actually tried to win fights and then you have kind of jessica rose clark and you're like yeah that's that that's that's better but <laughs> she's still gonna lose against the original version because she's at an experience deficit and she's still just not a great athlete yeah. like it, you you it get it gives you a better look at the the fundamental ceiling of this this kind of person. Yeah, seeing them trade body kicks or like straight right hands and things like that. It's just like yeah, okay, I is clearly faster and hits harder, and yeah, Clark can get in and mix it up and stay on her and be a little more aggressive. But if you're just going to keep resetting and restarting the exchange, you're just going to keep giving I a chance to be faster and hit harder. Yep. Title contender Jessica Rye, <laughs> probably, ish, maybe. Prop. That's what I say is that the, she's gonna then like run back up against Alexis Davis or something and just lose, probably, lose a tight competitive fight where she doesn't, you know, she gets bullied a little more and doesn't win. Anyway, all that said, the I Rose Clark fight or the I. Uh, Clark fight wasn't actually bad. It was it was a pretty interesting kickbox. Yeah, for that though, a fight that it really ticked me off, and for one reason only, and that was the commentary for Li Jing Long versus Daishi Abe, where it just felt like neither Gooden nor Hardy had any idea how Li Jing Long fights or who he is. They just kept being like, oh, well, he, we're not seeing that trademark wild aggression where he just comes out swinging wild haymakers. He's actually looking composed and like he can box a little. And it's just like, have you literally never seen the way he fights? It's a progression of a wild first round where he gets hurt like he did against Daishi Abe. And then he figures out what Abe is doing and he just picks him apart and uses to, to his to his credit and it, i guess this is the difference he got hurt way less bad than he normally yeah. does yeah like he, that he, was a he didn't go as hard thing. early in the fight yeah. but the rest of the fight it was like a trademark the best kind of trademark lesion long performance where he just had abe dead to rights and just kind of toyed with him for the rest of the fight yeah this was exactly one of those ones where you, you looked at it and you were just like you didn't win the first round, Daichi Abe, you are toast. Yeah. Like, you just knew, like, you're up against someone with a, like, more multi dimensional attritional game who gets better as the fight goes on, and you are someone who gets worse as the fight goes on. Like, you're a, a fast out the gate counterpuncher, and your best shot didn't do that well in the first, <laughs> you're toast. And yeah. that was what happened. He, he got. Uh, Jing Liang isn't a, a fantastic finisher, but yeah, he he just beat him up in the first round and then beat him up worse. As the fight went on. Yeah, I mean Good it was fight. beautiful to watch. It's yeah, Jing Liang. That's the thing is when he's not at an athletic disadvantage because he's still not like you know he's big and he's quick enough, but he's not a marvelously powerful athlete in the division. We've seen like his wrestling and grappling games have largely suffered and vanished because of that as a welterweight in the UFC. But if he's not in an athletic disadvantage, he is just one of the most fun technical fu kickboxers to watch in in the yeah. welterweight division. Yeah, he's just a he's just a really thoughtful fighter who's just going to make sure, you know, he's like one of these, you know, one of these dark horse guys like like Bilal Muhammad or whatever who's just mm -hmm. going to if you're losing to this guy, 
you're going to keep losing, and you're going to keep losing worse mm -hmm. as the fight goes on. He's just going to find the flaws in your game. He's going to put a little wedge in them, and he's just going to whack on it until you you eventually just fall to bits. Yeah, and that's... yeah, he's 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 great to watch. Uh, I'm glad he didn't do any more really disturbing. <laughs> Yeah. Like mountain you... in Game of Thrones style fouls, and I'm glad I can go back to being a fan again. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely like it, it, you're always gonna know that the, w when push comes to shove and when he panics a little, there's a chance that he might do something horrible that is just kind of inexcusable. But uh, it'd be fun to see him. I'm trying to think, like, it, I mean, it would be fun to see him in a fight like Bilal Muhammad. Yeah, I think I think Mohammed probably uh, has earned a bit more, uh, a yeah, bit higher, yeah. what with beating means and such like. But yeah, I like see like Mohammed Matthews, but we'll probably get to that in a in a bit. But I mean, Jing Liang, he's now seven and three in the UFC, so you know he's put together yeah. a hell of a streak, even if he's kind of like mostly styling on a very specific level of opponent. Yeah, he's a he's a tremendous like fairly skilled, incredibly determined mid-level gatekeeper, uh, mm -hmm. I think. is. So before that, uh, last fight on the prelim card, Peter Yan beat Teruto Ishihara, and man, did he beat Teruto Ishihara. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that, that was one of those things where you're just... Like, it, you know, it starts out early, and you're like, oh, Peter Yan, he's kind of being patient, he's looking and picking his spots. He's got to watch out for that left hand. Is he going to... And then, like, a minute passes, and you're like, oh, God. This is this is all going one way. Because he, he had Ishihara backing up, and he had him flinching, and he had him reacting. And he was reading that left hand, because that's the, the one thing Ishihara sits down on with any credibility. And that was just... It was yeah. a nightmare. Ishihara tried his one trick that he's learned in like which was mix up the left hand with a blast double yep. and it worked very very briefly the first time <laughs> and then he was like oh shit i'm done i can i can maybe kind of throw a, a a snap kick but there's tons of strikes coming back at me and that that was sort of the end yeah i'm, I'm really liking how peter yawn's game you can see what's really developing out of it is a fighter who he's probing and finding openings early in the fight, just finding little single strikes that'll land, angles that'll work, reading what his opponent's thrown back at him. And then he just starts to sit in the pocket and create angles and throw combinations. And I mean, that's, that's a joy to watch. It's a joy to watch somebody strike like that in MMA where you're, you're reading and creating opportunities and then you're stepping inside and you're exploiting them consistently without jumping way back out of the pocket and saying like, oh, I landed one shot. Now I got to reset and try again. It's like, no, I'm just going to sit here and turn to my right a little and then throw two more punches and then maybe step back out. Yep. He had just, he'd, that's the thing. He built an approach knowing like, I'm just going to keep my, Keep my right hand plastered up here. I'm just gonna step in. I know on timings X, Y, and Z, the left hand is coming back at me. All other points, I am safe, and I can open up on this guy. And very quickly, Ishihara learned it as well. And yeah, he's just a he's just a joy to watch. He's just like, you know, he's he's hard to take down. He punches strikes in combination. He works the body. He's great in the clinch. He's you know he been gotten to in wrestling before but then kind of learned how to fight back against that he's one of these guys you know you've got to be thrilled to watch him yeah to watch him move forward in the division you want to see him you know you want to see him up against other up-and-comers as well like um, like they just picked up nathaniel wood that fight would yeah, be huh? fantastic and they have ricardo ramos is fighting king hall kong but he's a real fun you know he's a fun action fighter to watch they got Benito Lopez and Sean O'Malley and Ricky Simon, like they've been going out and they've been getting all these really fun action bantamweights lately. And Peter Yan is going to be right in that mix. Yeah. 
Yeah, this was just like, you couldn't have asked for anything better from him. No. Perfect, perfect debut against somebody who, like, has generally been dangerous, has generally been at least a, a bit of a trouble, you know, troublesome, hard to knock out, and you had to plan carefully around him on the feet for two years. Yeah, and it's, it's, and it's notable that, you know, we might be looking at a Jimmy Rivera-type situation here as well, because Peter Jan, not a big finisher in ACB, and admittedly against, you know, tough guys, but... Yeah. You know, this was, you don't traditionally see first round knockouts like that from him. And that it, that kind of puts the rest of that division on notice a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Especially for somebody who's never been knocked out before. And like I say, I mean, you can see why he wouldn't have that kind of knockout record in the past. If he's been building this style, that's very like learning about how to approach an opponent and figuring out, okay, well, you know, cause that kind of thing that takes time. That takes skill to build. That's not just a natural, like here's my one punch knockout power that I lean on. It's having to develop crafty technical boxing that opens angles for you. MMA angles. I'll be. Oh yes. Yeah. Uh, as disruptive as they are. As disruptive 25, as they are. Uh, 25 that, years old. Another fight to just warm my heart in the depths of my soul. Song Yadong beat the absolute fuck out of Felipe Arantes. Even I picked Arantes. Even more than I thought he would. Like, I thought that Yadong could just kind of keep it safe, pot shot outside, be more clinical, and eventually he'd land a couple of shots that would drop Arantes, and that'd be it. Somewhere in like the second to third round, somewhere, you know, after a bit of time, he just took it to him, just yeah. took him out behind the woodshed and beat him with an axe handle. And yeah, man. that was the point, I think, first round when Arantes was like, he did his guard pulling thing mm -hmm. and you know, just jumped on him and just <laughs> beat the shit out of him. And you were just like, Oh yeah, that's not a good idea, is it? <laughs> <laughs> that's and that was so good to see because his base looked amazingly strong on top of Arantes. Just yeah, Arantes would try to move underneath him and he'd flatten him out and land short elbows, those body knees he landed, that like crushing GSP body knee, all while like maintaining ride and control. And on the feet, like it was the same thing as against Bart Kandare, where Arantes would come at him and throw, and he'd throw like three or four strikes, and maybe one would glance off Song Yadong and just eat two or three in response. Yeah. Lightning fast. And that's like, and Felipe Arantes has to kind of, you know, I mean, he has to I feel for him, because he yeah. has to go and look in, look in the mirror and like say to himself, that guy made me look like Barak Kandare. Yeah. Like... And that elbow what? he landed to finish the fight. It's just oh, like, man. I love afterward, too. He's like, yeah, that wasn't even like a big thing. Yeah, it wasn't that. There was no, like, wasn't trying to do anything with that. It wasn't really a major setup thing. It just was in the clinch, and I felt it, and I threw it. And I'm going to get, I'm going to improve a lot after this. I don't, you know, there's a lot that I didn't like or whatever. And he's like, what? Also, um, he, he, he threw body shots in combination. Yeah. And. There's no, there's no quicker way to my heart. No, like, let's be real. <laughs> like, and yeah, I mean, he looked, he looked phenomenal, and, and and that's one of the you know themes that we're getting that we're probably getting to on this card is the young dudes with potential. Pretty much just came out and were like, "This is why you were excited about me," and. Yeah. It's also I'm, what he, I'm really liking was perhaps from the, biggest. The, the, the fighters they're getting out of China now at this point is that it seems like a lot of these fighters, they may not have necessarily, I mean, Yadong looks like he has a pretty complete MMA game. They may not all look like they're that complete, but they all seem to be really invested in being very technical in at least one area. Like they're, really well-schooled strikers. They're not MMA kickboxers or, you know, things like that. And so you're getting people like Song Yudong where it's just like, there. you are clearly several levels of striking above Felipe Arantes, who has 
cut a really reasonable veteran career through the UFC for years functioning on that level of striking. Yep. So really hyped about that. Yadong also at Bantamweight. So, you know, you get guys like Peter Yan and Song Yadong and Nathaniel Wood and it's just oh, I'm it is like it. yeah, you like it's one of the reasons why I kind of miss WEC is WEC. Just yeah. like I could just watch Bantamweight. <laughs> I could just watch this division. Like and the, yeah. the, the especially the, all the tiny cages. Yeah. Yeah. It's they they've got a lot going. And I, I hope they don't just sort of drain the fun out of it the way the UFC tends to by I don't know, making everything feel the same. Mm. Uh, before that, Shane Young beat Rolando D, and um, it's too bad because Rolando D really is probably one of the like le- he's probably the the fighter right now that I enjoy the most, despite how clearly not cut out for MMA he is. Where, like, yeah, he's he's got a couple of intersecting major flaws, yeah. which like are. This is the thing. It's like, if you had one of these, you'd be able to survive, but you have at least two. Yeah, he, he he's really not durable enough to survive at this level. It's becoming clear with every yeah. fight. He's and... not He's not durable. He starts incredibly slowly, and he's just fundamentally not defensively very good. No, like those are he's three... amazingly porous. Yeah. Those are three major issues. Like because he's a functional, technical, offensive kickboxer. If you get into the second round, but yeah. the thing is that he's so visibly like hunched and tense and tight in the first round that it's almost impossible for any like decent offensive attacker to not hurt him yeah. and to not like. He needs, and he can only get his confidence back in very specific ways by like, he needs to win one or two consecutive exchanges. And then he'll be like, oh, yeah, now I can land my leg kick. And, you know, like he did against Ishihara. So, yeah. On. But like, man, that's a, that's a hell of a tightrope to walk and one which is just going to get cut out from under you the majority of the time. Yeah. Shane Young, if nothing else, he's. It, clearly more than tough enough to fight at this level and he's still like you know i still don't necessarily love his really like sparring style of walk forward kickboxing where he just throws a lot of light shots and then occasionally throws one in with power which i mean like that's good fun to like as a change of speed it's good a good way to catch people off guard and there's a lot to like about it but it also like as not being a sa- an at all sound defensive fighter and not being a um not really having another game to change up it means that like this he tends to still walk into a ton of big shots where he's trading light ones for power but d is just <laughs> not durable enough for that and uh young is i mean he he showed off a hell of a chin in this fight yeah, I mean, I'll I'll give him some I'll give him some. Uh, what he showed was at least you know he showed baseline athleticism and he showed that he knew the right game plan because he yeah. was just like I need to put this guy start slow as shit I need to push him back into the fence and fuck him up yep. and that's pretty much what he did. That so I'm willing to give him a like like a a Bokniak kind of mm-hmm. I'm starting to steal what, see what you're actually trying to do here kind of pass. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think he's going to be, he's again, he's going to be a good measuring stick. Yeah. He, he's going to be a, a, a good functional fighter in the division just because he's tough enough and he's athletic enough and he's willing to just go out and throw a lot and stay on the fight. It's, it'll be interesting. I mean, it was, it, it was a good bounce back to see from him from that Volkanovsky fight where he just so quickly just faded out of the fight was like, well, I guess I'll just try to survive this. Yeah, and, I mean that that may that may just be Volkanovski. Yeah, like it may be a that more term. of a function of how good Volkanovski is, because Young clearly got hit hard, very hard, several times in this fight, 
and then went right back into the pocket and right back with his just sort of plugging away short shots, keeping everything small, and then every now and then sneaking in a really crushing shot. And that elbow he finished the fight with was really nice. Mm. Had some nice elbows on this card. Yeah, if he can keep, if he can keep building the technique into his game so that he's he stays more defensively sound and that he keeps being creative as he mixes in those power shots. I mean, there is a lot to like about that style. He just needs to have more yeah. defense to go with it. Yeah, I mean, he need he needed the thing is he's been a shutter on his in his regional career and he showed. Yeah, he needed aggression and he showed it, and that's that's always like when there's a, a simple like. You need to do A, and then the fighter does A. It's always like a, a like, yeah, thumbs up from me. Yeah, it was a, it was even a big notable increase in his aggression from his regional fights, where he just kind of looked yeah. much more willing to just sit back and just spar. Um, for that welterweight, Song Kinan beat Hector Aldana, and uh, to Aldana's credit, he looked a lot better than he had before this, but he still is not a. UFC caliber fighter and Song Kinan is barely, and that was kind of it. Yeah, I and mean, what, what more can you say? These two guys, they don't look very good at all. Uh, I still cannot tell at all whether Song Kinan is actually any good or whether, like, and whether Bobby Nash is just terminally chinny. I think um, Kinan is big and powerful, but he's pretty, he, he, his overall game is pretty limited and he's not fast. Um, he's clearly got some speed in his hands that he's working on, but the rest of his game is pretty foot slow. And uh, yeah. Aldana is just kind of muscle bound and aggressive to a fault and runs into stuff all the time. And there you go. You got a knockout yep. late in the fight where Aldana just ran onto a right hand and got crumpled by it. Yeah. Aldana's wrestling looked a bit better than it has in the past, but yeah, that's it. Before that welterweight fight, Jake Matthews, Shinsho Anzai, and Matthews is continuing to look. I mean, he's showing that he can. He knows how to make good use of his athleticism now. He's still, you know, Anzai was still able to just kind of walk him down and bully him and push him back and make him have to react. But Matthews made all the right decisions and pulled the trigger on fast, powerful strikes while moving backwards. It was, you know, it's the kind of thing where it's still, it's like, okay, yeah, you still may not have the deepest fundamental technical game everywhere. You may not have a really deep bag of tricks to draw on, but now you look like a top shelf athlete who is just making, who knows enough of how to react in each situation to absolutely make that athleticism count. Yeah, he's yeah, he's able to just blow past guys like that, I think, now yep. increasingly. And is he just getting bigger from fight to fight? It seems like, that way. It, like, it what really the does. fuck is going on? Like, are they going to be calling him out, like, and, you know, coming to the cage now, Jake the Celtic Kid Matthews, and then, like, everyone in the arena just sees, like, little concentric rings start to come out <laughs> of, their, of their beers. Like, <laughs> he is... What the fuck? He's he's going to be a middleweight before long. It seems almost certain. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I mean, he and he's getting into that point where he's going to have to fight people who are upper level athletes, but also very technical. So yep. he's not going to be like like uh, Li Jingyang, who's like reasonably technical, but also just a a mediocre, fairly slow athlete. He's going to have to like how much is he going to be able to just kind of have a countering blitz game on people who come in on him? Yeah, I mean... And it, that's it, going to be interesting to see. Yeah, if some if he fights somebody like Kamaru Usman, how much does it look like his fight against Kevin Lee? You know? I would imagine tremendously similar. Yeah. <laughs> in, in all honesty. I'd like to see him fight someone like uh, Vicente Luke. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. Vicente Luke is a is like a straight technical kickboxer who's not going to fall for like, you know, back up, back up, back up, back up surge. He's yeah. just going to like put sh straight shots down the middle. But on the other hand, Vicente Luke is also someone who's not very good after the, he's not very good after like one round. So yeah. it would be an interesting matchup between two guys who are like both super athletic and 
Um, yeah, or or somebody like Marley Alves too, who has had mm, some problems of surging and yeah, who just but it seems to be putting together a more cautious, careful game, and is also a top shelf athlete who's kind of finding how technical can I be in what areas and. There are a lot of interesting fights for somebody like Matthews, who, as well as now, like ten fights into his UFC career, suddenly, you know. Mm. So he wins another. You know, he wins a fight like that against somebody more seasoned, uh, along those lines, and he'll probably be looking at fights. You know, like uh, oh. You know, uh, Leon Edwards or Alex Oliveira, or you know, getting up into Neil Magny, people like that before long. Yeah, yeah, I'd be, I'd be, I'd still, yeah, I'd give him another, maybe give him another, like, like a Zach Cummings or something, or a yeah. um, who's the guy who the the Tebow who beat him, Trattor Prezeris, someone, oh, someone like that. Yeah, yeah, that'd be just like a good test of brute consistency. Yeah, but yeah. But um, and he's only twenty three still, which I mean, you know, I I worry about ki- guys who start that young. I worry where they're going to be by the time they're thirty. But thirty's still seven years away. You know, like that's that's a lot of time for him to be still a pretty consistent, powerful force if, as he tries to round out his style. Um, let's see. After that. We got Yan Zhao Nan versus Vivian Pereira. And this is kind of, this is exactly why I was not as excited for this fight as I was when Nadia Kassem was in it. Because I really did feel like if Yan Zhao Nan beat Vivian Pereira, it wouldn't actually say that much about Yan Zhao Nan. It would mostly just say a lot about Vivian Pereira. And it did, which is, mm-hmm. it, she is so low output and so un able to press her physicality on uh, an opponent that there anybody who can will throw volume and has like even a little bit of reasonable footwork to stay away from her can take a decision yeah i mean she's uh, to me she she represents some of the issues of claudia gadelia like Mm -hmm. in that she has the same it's a lot of her stuff seems to just come down to posture and form yeah, so you watched her fight. Is she's just she's fighting out of a hunch the whole time, and she's fighting just out of a hunch. Kind of... She tends to sort of to short to short arm or to arm punch her way through things as a result. Yeah, she kind of rows her punches. You know, yeah. she's kind of like she's just kind of trying to drag drag herself forward, and you know, it's just going to sap her cardio, and it's just not it's just not efficient. Like it puts her head in the way in play in times when it shouldn't be and it just drains her cardio and yeah i mean what is there to say like she's the better she's the better athlete of the two by some margin she can't really doesn't have the technical game to be able to leverage that and um Jianan just just outworked her. She was just like, there's she's a ranges. functional volume kickboxer with a reasonably solid base, like baseline of technical range kickboxing. We still have no idea whether or not she can survive on the ground against anybody who's going to really press a grappling game on her. But yeah, Vivian Pereira didn't. She didn't try it at all. Yeah, I mean, and that's that's the thing. Like you're now like you look at Pereira and you're just like. Okay, so you can't win a volume kickboxing match against this, uh, and you don't have much of a defensive wrestling game. So, yeah, yeah. This is and this is not a this is not bantamweight. This is not a talent. This is not a talent deficient division. Yeah, there are plenty of other women who will chew you up and make you pay for these same mistakes going up. So. It's. I mean, it's. It's interesting. It's good for Jaunan to get another win. Maybe you know to keep the more experience and rounds she can get, the more likely she is to just kind of shore up the other aspects of a, what is still pretty clearly a very green total MMA game. And then being a volume striker who's, you know, got the cardio for it and is willing to just put a lot of offense out there and is not. You know, she's not defensively any kind of mastermind, but is technical enough to. In a division where people don't knock people out, she's technical enough to 
to make that be a difference, you know, kind of maybe Carolina Kovalkovich away forward. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly who I was thinking of. Yeah. And there's, there's always room for another Bisping. Yep. So it's a good showing for her. Good for her to get rounds. Good for her to get another win. And interesting to see her as a, as a foil for anyone who's just going to try and kickbox in that division. Who's just going to be like, Oh, I'm just going to go out and, you know, even somebody like Angela Hill, where she always gets stuck between that ba- battle of trying to throw for power or throw for volume and often can't control which one she's doing at any given time. It's like, how would you react to somebody like this who's just going to go out and consistently put volume on you? Um, Before that, flyweight bout, Matt Schnell, Nauki in a way. And yeah, this is... Man... I really not sure at all what Inoue was doing out there. I kind of read this going in. It's like, this is a pretty equal kickboxing match where Schnell's a good counterpuncher. Inoue likes to lead. Not, Inoue d- doesn't have a lot of power. Schnell, Schnell has really good fast hands, but he doesn't have much power either. And so it's going to be a pretty equal kickboxing match. And I assumed at some point Inoue would make Schnell kind of overreach himself and flurry a little or get a little wild. She did it a couple points. And Inoue would be able to wrap it up and take it to the ground and be the more technical fighter there. And he just never even looked at it. Yeah. I mean, this was another, this was another like mirror match obviating obvious personal flaws fight like yeah. again i'm i'm not sure that that in a way is a is a worse or you know fated for a lesser career than Matt Schnell in the ufc no. same with jessica rose clark and and Just i that. yeah so uh but yeah it was just the fact that schnell being able to fight the same guy as him allowed him to avoid the issues of like his chin because he was like oh yeah um in a way doesn't really have the power to threaten me you can't you know put me in compromising ground and pound situations like hector sandoval did so yeah it's just i'm just going to be able to work my counter punching game for three rounds yeah and I mean, it was it was a great. I actually, I really yeah. enjoyed it. I thought it was really. Yeah, they it were was pretty uh, equally matched. In a way, is a straighter puncher. He leads more, so he's going to get the drop on Schnell a lot and like open up combos more. And so it was a fun, good back and forth fight. But it was also just kind of maddening to be like, y'all are both capable of more than this, especially in a way like you you have a more well rounded game than just us putting yourself into a kickboxing match that shows that you don't have any power and are are not really a great defensive kickboxer. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, that's the thing. I'm like, I was, I was watching and I was thinking, I was expecting, I was, I, cause I was expecting in a way to, you know, get the better of a grappling exchange. And I was like, when has in a way really hit like a wrestling based takedown on someone? Yeah. And I was just like, I, I can't think of it. So yeah, it became it was like a, it was a good match because they they had two similar guys, but yeah, like you said, two. The focus was in a way has a, a very much a kind of straight line, uh, forward in and out style. You know, he's got that the jab and the right hand, the right straight, and Matt and Schnell is much more rotational left hook and the low kick, which to my mind probably pretty much won him the fight. Mm-hmm. Like it was less the boxing than it was just the fact that he landed. A fair few low kicks. Yeah, but it was it was really fun. But yeah, it, it's a, it was a bit of it was a bit of a bummer in that like I still feel like in in a way might have the slightly higher ceiling. But yeah, Chanel. But just watching him fight a fight like better... that gives you severe doubts about like implementing mm. that. You know. Yeah. I... All right. For that flyweight, Uka Sasaki took on Janelle Lausa and. One of the few fights which went almost exactly how you thought it would. Yep. Just fought a perfect fight out of the gate. Came out. Shot a takedown immediately. Worked hard to get takedowns. Held his own standing just enough that when the fight was there, he didn't just get chewed up. And then when he finally got uh, Lausa to give up his back with that beautiful back take where he like wrapped up the wrist from the far side while or from like yeah from the far side with his foot over and then just use that to turn him and jump on his back and that was gorgeous 
and that was over. Yep. Uh, pretty much what everyone expected, but you know, it's good to see Sasaki get back on track. He's uh, always fun. Yep. Call that Sergio Pettis, which he's, he's not going to get that fight nope. at all. Not at all. Not even slightly. But, um, you know, he might be able to take, I mean, he, they might throw him in against somebody like Ray Borg. Yeah. He wouldn't win that. No, no, he wouldn't. <laughs> but they might they might give him that fight, something like that. Or just, you know, toss him back down to fight Ben Wen or uh Brandon Moreno or Pantoja or somebody like that. Yep, down for all of those. Pantoja sounds good to me. Yeah. All right, and before that, to open the card, women's flyweight bout, Ji Young Kim fought Melinda Fabian, and to her credit, Fabian looked much improved. She was sitting down yep. on her punches a lot better, throwing straighter, not wild arming and, you know, fl- flailing arm punches as much. And it, But it was still, like, the absolute test of, Ji Young Kim, are you really this one track of a... Are you so one track, counterpunch, right hand, happy that you cannot beat, like, you will be nip-tuck with literally every single person in the division and maybe not win any more fights. And uh, she squeaked it out. Yeah, it's like, you're going to be nip-tuck with everyone? And the answer is still, yeah. Yeah, she's going to be nip-tuck with everyone. She is a good enough athlete and a good enough, uh, has good enough timing and patience on her strikes an accuracy to win fights still. But this was like, this is a, a softball matchup for some of your style. Somebody's just going to walk on to you all fight and eat counter punches. And she's so low output and so choosy that it's still just like, you are barely going to take these fights. Mm. Oh, yeah, well. not really much to, not really much to bring off. Off from that one, I think it's in some ways it's a uh, Fabian is a worse fighter than Justine Kish, and she didn't do as well against her. Uh, I think you know Fabian definitely improved, but yeah. yeah, it's not exactly one of those wins where you're just like, oh yeah, revise revise expectations upwards. No, it's it's, it's going to be continually every fighter. It's gonna, every fight's going to be a test of Jian Kim. It's like, are you improving? Have you solved your major flaws? If not, how close is this going to be just based off that? And, mm-hmm. uh, anyway, back to the top. Leon Edwards, great strong coming out performance for him. Kind of coasted over the final rounds, which is not great to see because he visibly had Cerrone hurt multiple times over the fight, and it felt like he could step on it a little more, and he looked fresh still, so it's kind of... But it it was very good to see him win a consistent, high-level yeah. striking match without was, having to panic wrestle. Yeah, because there is a lot of... The, in the past, Edwards has been a fighter who he gets cracked inside. Like, Cerrone cracked him several times, landed right hands and things like that, and he just backs way off, resets way outside, and then looks at how can he can push this fight to the cage and start wrestling instead. Because he has really not liked trading inside in the pocket before. And this looked like a lot of that was solved. He came out yeah. of clinch exchanges with those hard elbows over and over. He dipped in and he, you know, would throw hands with Cerrone and often get the better of it. Or even if he ate shots, he wouldn't just go way out and just be like, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. He'd just go right back to striking exchange. And that's what you need to see from Edwards if he's going to thrive at the top end of this division. Yeah, I mean, it was good, you know, it was it was good to see him, it, it's been good to see him, you know, win against guys like Sabata and Barbarena, but like in those fights, you were just like I need to watch you consistently beat these guys on the feet without yep. looking worried. Yeah. And Roni is a much better striker than either of them, even if he is, you know, visibly visibly somewhat weathered and it was it was just good to see him get five hard rounds in. You know, yep. much like Till, I guess. Yeah. You know, it was just like you didn't put on a flawless, like, oh my god, I'm thrilled to see you go forward kind of performance, but it was just good to see you win or good to see you compete consistently mm-hmm. in in a phase which I thought might have troubled you. Yeah. Definitely. So good showing from Edwards. 
OSP keeps the balance of power on weird at light heavyweight. And uh, Li Jinglong keeps streaking. He's going to be somebody that UFC probably le continues to lean heavily on in China. And Peter Yan and Song Yadong and Jake Matthews all looked really good. So, And that's what you want to see. I mean, that's, that's the main, you know, the main thing you really want to see from these cards is like, you want to catch the early like, yeah. moments of someone really yeah. get hitting their stride. Yeah, you want to see fighters, especially like Peter Yan and Song Yadong, just show up and look phenomenal. So, on that note, you can find me on Twitter at these same time, and you can find Phil on Twitter at Evil Greg Jackson. You can find both of us over at BloodyElbow.com, day in, day out. We will be back later or next week for the MMA Depressed Us because there's no UFC event, and then I'll be back for a double header vivisection the week after that, where we'll be doing the Tough 27 finale and the uh, UFC 226. So look forward to all that. We'll have If I Did It and Heavy Hands and maybe Six Round Retro and all that stuff we do week in, week out next week. Th give this video a like. That's a thumbs up down there on YouTube. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, MMANation.com, D-O-T-C-O-M, all spelled out. That's where you get all the latest Bloody Elbow shows, analysis, interviews, all that stuff we do. So thanks everyone for tuning in, and we will see you next time.